So with my newfound sense of courage to face my doubts, I decided to go straight to the most important things about my religion. And I decided that was the basic salvation message. So the United Pentecostal Church has some differences between mainstream Christianity and even some denominations of Pentecostalism. And I couldn't just leave that church if the denomination had some of these essential things correct. Leaving my church and my denomination was pretty much equal to backsliding. And your salvation was pretty much at stake for doing this. So my idea was I was going to talk to my pastor about the sort of main, most important beliefs of the church. And even though I knew most of them off the top of my head, I wanted to go much deeper than I had before. And I wanted to view this with sort of a uh, critical mindset. Let myself have concerns and try to address those concerns. So I had every intention of setting up an appointment with my pastor, but it turns out I didn't need to because uh, about two services after I decided I was going to have a meeting with my pastor, I got called into his office anyway. So I sat down with him and he asked me what was going on. And I said, well, I, I'm actually, I've had doubts lately, but I feel like I'm doing better. I feel like I'm um, just have a lot of questions about some of the ideas of the church. I want to discuss the salvation message. Do you have a book? Do you have something I can read? Do you have scriptures you want me to look up? Uh, what do you suggest? He walked over to his bookshelf in his office and almost an entire bookshelf was taken up with this book. Uh, the New Birth by David K. Bernard. He said, I agree with everything this book has to say. I think, it, I think it's the best defense of our uh, salvation doctrine. So I had very high hopes receiving this book. I was really excited. And quickly I was very impressed with the book. Um, some of the concerns that I had were actually addressed and uh, my mind was slightly changed. But the way this book is set up is it kind of starts with the, the more uh, broad things, the more mainstream things about Jesus, about giving your life to Christ, things like that. And, and then it kind of moves into some of the less common doctrines. But I'm going to discuss the big problem I had with one of the, the ideas. The problem was when we got into tongues and salvation. The church taught that tongues was a sign of receiving the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, whatever you want to call it. Speaking in tongues was something that automatically happened the first time you got filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's not like they were teaching, like, force yourself to speak in tongues. Uh, they were teaching that it was just sort of a byproduct of receiving the Spirit. And if you spoke in tongues, people you knew, and other people around you knew, oh, they received the Spirit of God, they uh, gave their life over to Christ, and that's part of their new birth, and... Um, as long as they've repented and they're baptized, they're, they're saved. Now, it's the with evidence of speaking in tongues that was um, really giving me some doubt. I believed in tongues. I believe it existed. I believe it was a real thing. I still spoke in tongues on a regular basis. It was not that I didn't believe at this point that tongues were fake or wrong. The thing about tongues that I, I was having a problem with was it being a salvational thing. I had some questions about that. I, I wasn't sure if I was convinced that it was something that was necessary. Now, the section that really started to throw me, not a sign of the Spirit's abiding presence, which discusses how you can speak in tongues and not actually be saved. The first line of this passage is, speaking in tongues is the initial sign of receiving the Spirit, but by itself does not prove the abiding presence of the Spirit. Many more important evidences of the Spirit's abiding presence exist, such as the fruit of the Spirit. In the absence of these characteristics, speaking in tongues does not guarantee that the Spirit dwells in one and controls his life. Now this kind of surprised me. If tongues was such an important sign of God's Spirit in the first place, at least in the initial sign, why would it not be an important continuing sign? If it's something that only God can do, then why shouldn't it be a sign that God is still in your life? God could take that away. And one of the things this, this book addresses is the reason for tongues being a sign of salvation is so you're not worried whether you're saved or not. If you can speak in tongues, that means that you did receive God. And you don't have to question like, like how somebody says the sinner's prayer and they're not sure if they're saved. One of the reasons they claim that God wants people to speak in tongues, you know, as a sign they, they receive the Spirit is so people know, oh, I'm saved. Oh, uh, God spirit entered me. 
So if you could speak in tongues without the Spirit, doesn't that sort of defeat the purpose? It says that someone could still believe false doctrine, resume a life of sin, or refuse God's leadership in other areas, but still speak in tongues, and still be unsaved. Because the claims that you could have faith for the one gift, but not other things, and not give your life to Christ in other ways. It says, even if the recipient turns from God or abuses the gift, God seems to leave a portion of it to encourage the backslider to repent. How would that do that? Uh, to me, that would say to me, it's not real. It would do the complete opposite of what it's claiming. That wouldn't be encouragement for me to repent. That would be proof that it wasn't spiritual or supernatural. It claims that it's also possible that the human mind or spirit can learn to speak in tongues. When God enables someone to speak in tongues, he apparently places the words in his brain. God directs the speech, but also does so by using the person's physical apparatus, including brain cells, nerves, voice box, mouth, and tongue. It is possible, then, that the brain may store these words just as it stores other information. Next time God moves on the individual, he may use new words, or he may activate the existing words in memory. This could explain why some people repeat the same phrases when the spirit moves on them. Over a period of time, the brain can possibly subconsciously learn to activate this stored combination of words on its own. If so, even without the moving of the spirit, the person could utter words that were at one time given by the spirit. Really? I thought this was a huge sign. Why is this a sign if we could subconsciously learn it or remember it? If we could subconsciously have those things put into our brains by God and then have our brains memorize those things, couldn't we do that by hearing other people do that? I mean, this was starting to actually make me question tongues in general. I, I didn't have any questions that tongues was supernatural at this point. This book was making it worse. If we have to go into this all this detail about how you can speak in tongues without the Spirit, there must be people who do so. If He, he wouldn't be going into such great lengths if this wasn't a common thing. And then, he even blames possible tongues on Satan. In addition, we should not overlook the possibility of false imitations of tongues by men, or even counterfeit tongues caused by the power of Satan. So yes, Satan can mimic miracles. So wait a sec- wait, 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 hold on. How do I know that I wasn't ever speaking in tongues by the power of Satan then? How would one tell the difference between Satan's tongues and God's tongues? and my tongues. This goes back to the, the very first video I made in the series talking about mishearing God and not being able to tell if something was God, something was Satan, or something was myself. And I was running into the same dilemma when you're talking about tongues. Tongues apparently could be given by God, given by oneself, or given by Satan. How How am I supposed to figure out which one it's coming from? I had no doubt that it was from God, but what if I was wrong? What if this church was manipulated by Satan? I mean, there are Pentecostals who believed in speaking in tongues and believed that our church was a false church because they taught it was essential to show that you had this, the Holy Spirit. And we thought that the other Pentecostals were fake because they didn't have the correct doctrine. And so, I mean, we kind of thought each other were manipulated by Satan. Were we all right? Were we, were we, was one of us right? Were neither of us right? Were both of us right? I, I, this is making it worse. Was tongues this a big sign? This book was actually convincing me the opposite.